Okay, quiet down over there in the stands. What's it called? <laughs> well, first of all, what's what called? Okay. The chatter from where? From the person sitting next to you. Okay, it's Saturday Fantasy Baseball. Yep. Good morning to everybody. Boston Paul. Well, you can't hear me yet. Yes, we can. Oh, you can? Sounds you good. tell the chat room the sound is good, okay. Leonard. Okay, okay. Everybody can hear me. I wasn't going to say anything. But, what do I get forced into this or what, you people in the chat room? Good morning to everybody, first and foremost. Good morning to Boston Paul. Good morning to Danny Fuller, Captain Danny. Good morning to Eddie Heckman and Teresa Heckman. Triple play. And we're waiting for the chat room to fill up. It seems to be quite light this morning, but there's a lot going on. At least if there is some, you know how I feel about trade rumors and free agent signings. I, I really am not a huge fan like Lenny is of talking about potential trades, potential targets and stuff. But of course, this is hot stove season and the manager meetings are coming up quickly. So... We uh, will be talking about some recent trades. We will be talking about some potential free agent signings. We're going to talk about Otani today. And it's more of a point about how things work in baseball, not just about Otani. I will say this. Uh, So... We have guest Boston Paul. Is that you, King Hap? I think that's you. I see what's going on here now. I see what's going on. We got. I was going to comment on Boston Paul saying that he's awful at fantasy, but King Hap is playing a trick on us here. He's pretending to be Boston Paul, and then, of course, he's admitting that he stinks at fantasy, but... Really quite the contrary. Boston Paul works harder than anybody I've ever seen in fantasy. He is adamant and very competitive. And he you better believe if you're in a league with Boston Paul, you will not get away with anything. He's there the minute the free agents become available. He's in there trying to make trades, not just for his own benefit, but he's paying attention to every other team. Whether that's a compliment or not, it is what it is. And uh, Boston Paul has won several leagues because of his willingness to put the work in, as Lenny would say. And uh, I see you, Eddie. I see you. Good morning to Chris Gallo, Chris and Debbie Gallo. Good morning to Rotorius. Okay, great to see you. Excellent to see all of you filling up in the chat room. Now, uh, you know, there is some... Um, oh, good. The turd family is here. I'm part of the turd family now. That's what I say. I'm part of the turd family. And I can guarantee that, okay? All right. Eddie points out Davey Johnson is on the Hall of Fame ballot. Of course, Davey Johnson made a name for himself as a second baseman with the Orioles. But... His best season really did come when he hit a career-high 43 home runs. He played second base, and at that time, it was a major league record for a second baseman. And Lenny also added to what Eddie posted in the chat room about Davey Johnson and that he was never really, he didn't have multiple excellent seasons, but then he went on to be a manager and one of his most notable accomplishments as a manager came 11 years after he hit those 43 home runs as a second baseman and he was a manager of the Mets. He was very confident. He became the winningest manager in Mets history at the time. He also made an impact with the, the Reds, the Orioles, the Dodgers, and the Nationals. And by the time his managerial career ended in 2013, he had won 1,372 games, five division titles, one pennant, and one World Series title. So 
Thank you for your input, Eddie. Of course, Eddie is our resident uh, Orioles insider here in the chat room, and we appreciate his input. Now, the MLB put out the public report, okay, of their joint drug prevention program for 2023. There were 11,783 drug tests administered, including 2,233 blood tests. There was only one positive test for um, Stan- Stanislaw, which is a steroid, we know. But the interesting thing to me is that every year we get more and more of this. Now, you tell me what you think in the chat room. And I'm not knocking people with ADHD. But when you're using, look, I think, first of all, as a Major League Baseball player, you have access to any doctor you want. You can pretty much pick and choose. You have the money to pay any doctor you want. And what are the chances... Because the the prescribed medication for ADD is uh, basically methamphetamine, Adderall, but it's uh, basically the legal form of amphetamines, which we know over the years has been taken by players in baseball. I mean, there was a time where... Guys would come into their clubhouse and they would find bowls of pills. My mom called them whiteies or cross tops. Now, basically, you just have to, if you go to the doctor and you get your doctor to prescribe you ADD medicine, you're basically on methamphetamine the entire season. And I'm not knocking these people, but now they're 61, 61 players with therapeutic use exemptions just for ADD. There's also a couple for other things, but mostly you're going to find the therapeutic use exceptions exemptions granted for ADD. And baseball is a long season, okay? So if you can legally go and, and take some speed to get through the season, why in the world wouldn't you do it? I mean, I get it. I don't think these drug tests are even... I just think that they should forget about the testing, forget about it all. If a player wants to do drugs and shorten his lifespan and have his balls shrivel up and have a whole bad mentality about life, that's up to them. I I just think that this whole drug testing thing is a waste of time because, first of all, if you want the drugs, you're going to get them from a doctor. Number two... There's always one step ahead of these tests, okay? There's plenty of players that are on drugs that do not show up in these blood tests. And you think about how much money and effort it takes just to try to prove whether baseball players are doing drugs or not when they can get it from their doctor anyway. It just seems like a huge waste of time. Are they... They don't test for weed, I don't think. Actually, they do, which is strange since weed is now legal in a lot of states across the country. And obviously, weed is not a performance-enhancing drug. But we've seen players get their career derailed over smoking some weed or eating some gummies or what have you. Just, you know, just that's what I want to hear from in the chat room. What do you think? I know, I shouldn't say balls shrivel up, but okay. Oscar Gonzalez, claimed by the Yankees. Look, I was a big fan of Oscar Gonzalez going into last year, and all he did was wreck my season on multiple teams. He never played, and when he did play, he stunk it up. He's only played in the majors a couple seasons now and really not even full seasons in either one of these. In 2022, Oscar Gonzalez had 362 at bats, 39 runs, 11 home runs, one stolen base, but he was caught stealing twice. But he hit 296 batting average. Now, I obviously wasn't relying on Oscar Gonzalez for some stolen bases since he caught, caught more than he actually stole. And then this past season in 2023 proved me right because he never even attempted to steal a base all of 2023. And as I said, he was so bad and he did not get much playing time. He had 173 at-bats total for the Cleveland Guardians. 
he had two home runs and 12 RBIs, but the biggest problem here was that he batted 214. He went from a 296 batting average to a 214 batting average in one year. And those of you who decided to take a chance on Oscar Gonzalez later on in your drafts, thinking that he was going to be some kind of repeat customer, you were very sadly mistaken, along with me. So you have good company in that, okay? You look at what he does. He doesn't hit lefties good. In 2022, he still managed to hit lefties with a 266 batting average, but obviously better against righties, which is fine when you're talking about these splits against righties and lefties because obviously the majority of pitching in baseball is from right-handed pitching. So maybe they stink a little bit more against lefties, and then you could say, well, this is like the big side of a platoon, and I can deal with it. But last year, Oscar Gonzalez hit 194 against lefties. You look at his strikeout rate was over 25% last year. Boo hoo. It was only 19% in 2022. So his strikeout rate went up significantly. All right. He never really took a walk to begin with. So we don't even need to talk about the fact that his walk rate also went down. His contact rate is the big thing for me. Went from 79.3% in 2022 all the way down to 73.4% in 2023. His batting average on balls in play was inflated in 2022. It was a whopping 345. Now, last year, it seemed to have evened out, normalized to 278. I will not draft Oscar Gonzalez next year. I do not see any sign that he can be a sleeper pick. I do notice that Oscar Gonzalez played outfield. He specifically played the most in right field, but he also plays left field. Hold on a minute. One of these is Soto and one of these is... uh, Oscar Gonzalez. Right. Okay. So you got, and the reason I bring Soto up is because with the Yankees um, acquiring Oscar Gonzalez, it immediately makes me think, all right, well, how serious, I I know that Oscar Gonzalez isn't going to replace Soto anywhere and whether or not, but here's the thing. They both play the same positions. Now, last year with Soto, he played all of his outfield positions in left field but in previous seasons when he was with the nationals he also played a lot of times in right field so soto is capable of playing either left or right field with oscar gonzalez who by the way i'm not even saying that oscar gonzalez is going to get an opportunity to play clearly the yankees have some outfield depth that they need to cover and the talks Well, we're going to talk about the talks on Soto with the Yankees. Of course, they're the big name that is being discussed. And it's not just because it's the Yankees, but also because there are really serious conversations going on with the Yankees trying to acquire Soto. He, like I said, he spent all of the last year in left field. Oscar Gonzalez, on the other hand, he played 32 times in the outfield, two of them were in left field, and 30 of them were in right field. He can play both sides, but you can't forget that the Yankees' main right fielder is Aaron Judge. So, that leads me to believe that if they're going to give Oscar Gonzalez a chance, it's going to be in left field. And by the way, I did hear, and we'll talk about, as I said, the talks with between the Yankees and Soto have stalled in recent days, and it... I'm not trying to say that's because of Oscar Gonzalez. Believe me, I have no love for Oscar Gonzalez. And I will say it loud and proud. That guy will not be anywhere near my fantasy roster next year. You like him, you go get him. By all means, I hope you're drafting against me because he won't touch my roster. Got it, Leonard? Got it. Okay. Big crowd in the chat room. Big crowd. I must say hello to everybody in the chat room again. Thank you so much for joining us for Fantasy Baseball Saturday. We have Chris and Debbie Gallo, Big Al on the prowl, one of my favorite people. We got to do lunch again, okay? We'll wait for the spring, then we're going to lunch. 
We haven't been able to de- do lunch in three, four years now. I hope I recognize you still. Okay, Danny, Captain Danny and Penny, Eddie and Teresa, James K is here, King Hap. All right, thanks for, all right, now you're not playing with me anymore. Leonard Donaldson, great to see you. Laura and Mary, wonderful to have you aboard. Leonard, of course, you got Meryl. Is Mitchell here, Leonard? Mal Pal is here. Mal Pal and Tina. Tina's here. Tina, you're not there today, but I'll still say hi to you. Mitchell's here. Proctorius is here. Mitchell and Merrill are here. The Hartson Brothers. Tommy Johnson. Tommy Johnson, great to see you. Triple play. Rotorius and triple play. Listen, Wonderful and crowd. And, Turd. of course, how can we forget the turds? Okay. <laughs> there you are, my friend. Big Al on the prowl. Nice to see you, dude. Thanks for the update. All right. Now... On November 30th, MLB announced that Otani has won the 2023 Edgar Martinez Outstanding Designated Hitter Award. Otani is the second player to ever win the award in three consecutive years. He joins Big Poppy, who won five consecutive times from 2003 to 2007. If you can believe this, Marcelo Zuna finished second in voting while Jordan Alvarez, Bryce Harper, and J.D. Martinez also received vote. Clearly, this vote is not determined by the sports media vultures or Marcelo Zuna's name would never have come into play on this. All right? That's from Andy Martino from the Mets. He's a New York Mets beat writer. Now... Another couple of rumors that we have, and these are also, I, I'm i not sure these are from Andy Martino, but let's talk about the Yankees and the Soto rumors. The Padres are asking for Michael King plus money for Juan Soto and Trent Grisham, but I do believe, and we'll talk about this more, everybody doesn't know anything, okay? That's the truth of the matter, Especially when we're talking about Otani, but we'll get to that later. There's big gap in offers in Soto talks with the Yankees, and that is why this these talks have slowed. Now, Malpal pointed out to me the other day before any of these beat writers got a chance to talk about this, that he thinks that Juan Soto trade will include three teams because... The Padres already have a lot of money invested in several players, including Xander Bogarts. You have Machado and others that are still a part of this team. And whether or not they want a lower payroll, they're in for a couple hundred million dollars, whether they like it or not. Now, with Soto, they really need, they're looking to bring back some actual MLB ready players who can, uh, who can help the team win because of all the pieces that they are stuck with. Now, there's no secret that the Padres need pitching. They definitely need some pitching with all their pitchers going to free agency, such as Blake Snell, you got Hayter, and there's a couple others. Now, they point out that these two teams with the Yankees and Soto and Padres do could become a decent fit. The Yankees have some young pitchers to offer, but the Yankees are reluctant to trade two guys in particular. So far, Clark Schmidt, which I can't even really get why. Really, the Schmidt. He did enjoy a solid 14-start stretch between May and August, which he posted a 6-2 and record with the 309 ERA, 107 whip, and 56 strikeouts with only 15 walks across 70 innings. But he stunk it up. He did not end the season with good momentum. Okay, his ERA down the stretch was 573 with a 152 whip across his final nine starts. That's 44 innings. And he closed out the season with a record of 9 and 9, a 464 ERA, a 135 whip, 149 strikeouts, and 46 walks in 159 innings. So, Thumbs down on this guy. All right. I don't know what the Yankees think. They're going to get Juan Soto for this guy, but they're going to, they're also talking about Michael King. They don't even want to give him up. 
The right-hander wrapped up the season with a 275 ERA and a 115 whip with 127 strikeouts across 104 and two-third innings. He worked as a starter and a reliever. He is very good at switching, which means he's, you know, he's flexible. He switches between starter and reliever, and that flexibility may afford the team some flexibility with his position ahead of 2024. What are the chances Anthony Volpe gets traded? I know, that's ridiculous, right? But come on, man. Anthony Volpe, he would bring back a ton, okay? Might be, I know, I know this, this is going to cause a lot of ruckus in the chat room. Anthony Volpe, okay? Yes, I know, he's good. But let's think about this rationally here. His performance this rookie season was out of this world, really. He had a couple of bumps in the road, but he finished the season with 21 homers, 24 steals. His defense at shortstop kept him in the lineup when he was struggling with his bat. Okay? Will... The, I guess the Yankees probably aren't even close to considering Anthony Volpe, but they do have Oswald Peraza, who never got a chance. All right. Jeff Passan wrote that at least three teams, the Rangers, the Mets, and the Red Sox, have turned their attention away from Otani. This is according to MLB Trade Rumors, who got the info from ESPN. The Rangers' exit from the Otani bidding dovetails with recent comments from their general manager, Chris Young, who just yesterday told reporters that he does not anticipate spending to the same extent that he did in the past two off-seasons. Now, this is to turd, a resident Rangers insider. Texas spent more than $500 million in 2021 and 2022 off-seasons when they signed Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, John Gray. They also spent $200 million last winter when they added Jake DeGrom, Nathan Eovaldi, and Andrew Haney. Plus, they took on the Max Scherzer nonsense. Now, the Mets, who got rid of Scherzer, right? What a good little tie-in here for Laura and Mary. The Mets, there's been a lot of question about Otani's desire to play in the New York spotlight. But I'll tell you this, I know for 100% certain, these questions about Otani's desire to play in on the West Coast are made up. There is no way that Otani told anybody Okay, that he wants to play on the West Coast. You want to know how I know that? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a few minutes. Okay. Nice. Now, Andy Martino from SNY, that's the Mets guy. He points out that Otani, that the Mets primary focus at the moment is Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And with that being said, there's no way that they have ruled out acquiring Otani. And that's not just because I like Otani to the Mets, but it's just based on reason. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The Red Sox are known to be seeking top of the rotation help for next season, which isn't going to apply to Otani at all, right? Because he's mending from the elbow surgery. He would definitely... Well, we expect him to be a factor in a rotation in 2025, but Boston's focus thus far has been more on the trade market than on free agency. And what do you think, King Hap, Boston Paul, or Boston insiders of the chat room? I want to know how you feel. Do you think, do you agree that the Red Sox are out on the Otani talks? It doesn't mean that the Red Sox are not willing to spend lavishly on free agents this winter, but if their pursuit of immediate rotation help eventually leads them to free agency, it'd make for a particularly expensive offseason to pursue Otani. And, of course, that still leaves them with problems in their rotation. So then what? Are they going to also target Blake Snell, George? Jordan Montgomery, etc., etc. 
While those three clubs seem to be out of the mix, according to the rumors, by the way, which I disagree that the Mets are out of the mix on Otani, all right? The market for Otani with those clubs supposedly out of the mix include the Dodgers, the Cubbies, the Angels, and now da, 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 the Blue Jays. Yes, sir, the Blue Jays. Okay. Now let me catch up with the chat room here. Lenny says the Baltimore needs a closer big time. Lenny says nobody knows nothing. Nothing, honey? Nothing. Okay. All right. Eddie Heckman. Doot to do. Yeah, should have contacted Willie Stargill for your greenies. How do you say his name? Stargill. Stargill. I know. I always I always mispronounce Willie Stargill. All right. Boston Paul says Bull pays the next big star. D to D. Then what are you talking about, Oscar Gonzalez? What are you going to do with Oscar Gonzalez? Do you like him? You said you liked him. Tell me why you like Oscar. Because when I went and took a double take at Oscar, he did not impress me whatsoever. And I told you why. Malpel says, don't trade with the Yankees. They always trade garbage disguised as top prospects. And he listed a few just to name off a couple. Blake Rutherford, Justice Sheffield, remember him? Jorge Mateo, Zach Littell, James K. Oh, wait, not James K from the chat room. Chance Adams, Dustin Fowler, do to do Now, Turd says, signing a starting pitcher and a few relievers won't cost that much, so he's technically accurate, all right? That's about his manager over there for the Rangers. We're talking about Chris Young here. Now, Otani considering the Blue Jays makes me think way less of Otani. <laughs> okay. It's not really Otani in charge here. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his agent and how his agent works. Okay. He wants to know what's attractive about playing with Vlad Jr. and Bichette. And King Turd also chimes in that he does believe the Rangers will keep Montgomery. I like it. Chris Gallo says the Red Sox will not get C's or Jimenez. Boston Paul's talking about, well, this is just a rumor that Boston Paul read, although he puts it in the chat room that it's a fact the Red Sox will trade for Dylan C's and Jimenez for Duran and a top prospect, but even I know, I highly doubt they're going to get rid of Jaron Duran at this point, but as we mentioned... Yes, you're right, I did like... Uh, Gonzalez, but I'm telling you, I'm one of his fantasy managers from 2023, and when that happens to you, you definitely take a second look, because Oscar Gonzalez might have single-handedly wrecked my season. I know I made some other mistakes, like trading Marcelo Zuna like a dumbass, okay? But it is what it is. You make some mistakes, but I was absolutely high on Oscar Gonzalez last year, and now I'm absolutely not going to touch him with a 10-foot pole. Everything about him does not impress me at all. Oh, he has potential like Manessis. Okay, all right, here we go. This is from The Athletic. This is a great article. All right. Sam Bloom, Andrew Baggerly, and Fabian Ardaya wrote about Nez Balello, creative artist agency in Los Angeles with an office right there at Angel Stadium, too, by the way. He is in charge of Otani. All right. He also is the agent for many celebrities and high profile people. He has a very strict uh, um, control over his players. And this is why you know nothing about Otani. You know nothing about where he prefers to play. And this is why. Now, I just took some notes here. I'm going to be referring to this article that talks about Nez Bolello, the agent, the infamous or the famous agent, 
for Creative Artists Agency in Los Angeles, says he maintains strict control that otherwise would be consumed by the news cycle, wildfire of rumor, innuendo, and misinformation. In 2017, it was the first time that Otani signed. It was extremely secretive. Executive card drops off the team executives at one entrance in one door they get rushed into a private room and a different car picks them up at a different entrance here's a quote each of the seven team contingents were eventually led into an inner sanctum where otani awaited them dressed in a sports coat with agents flanking him on either side Teams had two hours to present their case. Then they were brought down the elevator and ushered out of the building as discreetly as one of creative agencies, celebrity clients seeking to avoid the paparazzi. Nobody knew anything until Billy Epler got the call and he said he was so surprised that he fell out of his chair. At the same time that Billy Epler got the news, this guy, I'm going to just call him Nez. That's his name, Nez Bolello. This guy, Nez, at the same time, he was telling Billy Epler about Otani coming to the Angels. The news was handed to a specific set of reporters. And by the time Billy Epler could get to the rest of his office, from his office desk chair to the front office, okay? He, everybody already knew about Otani coming to the Angels. Now, Otani has not spoken to reporters in nearly four months. His personal preference is to limit media appearances. Now, I don't know if that's the preference of Otani or the preference of his agent, But he only takes questions after he pitches and he is completely off limits at all other times. When he does speak, the length of his answers is often limited to just a few minutes, sometimes limited to only one or two questions. He's only made a couple of media appearances, right? He conducted a photo shoot with GQ magazine in 2022. He did a special with Fox's Ben Verlander, who is also represented by Creative Agency, okay? And this year, Otani participated in a documentary that was aired on ESPN. It's pretty cool, too. In that documentary that was aired on ESPN, Scott Boris was in the background a lot, but they blurred his face out. While uh, Balelo, which is we call him Nez, okay, Nez Balelo, He appeared prominently in the documentary. Now, nobody knows how much he had to do with the production of this documentary. But it is telling when you hear that Scott Boris's face was blurred out of the background and his face was absolutely prominent. But there is a clear pattern of Otani's media appearances that are being driven by his agent. And that tendency has made Nez a polarizing figure. Now, this is interesting. I thought this article just says so much more than it actually says. It really tells you to question everything that just because some beat writer is bored or wants a certain player to come to their team, they make up sources, they make up insight, and it's all a bunch of bulldinky and poppycock. But this is interesting and it really changed my mind and this is how easy it is for the media to sway your opinion of certain players. And teams, I was pissed off at the Angels. I felt it was horrible what they did to Otani. Not only did they not trade the guy at the deadline, they wanted to win, which is fine. But when you got a guy who's clearly got issues with he's fighting off injuries like crazy and you don't put him on the injured list because you're so concerned about your own team making the playoffs, that's how I felt. And part of that reason why I felt, in fact, all of the reason why I felt that way is because nobody said anything. Here's the thing. In the days after he toured his UCL, there was radio silence from Otani and his representation. Instead, it fell on Angel's general 
manager to inform the media. He announced the torn UCL. And then, of course, we all criticized him. We all criticized the workload. We all criticized that now this guy's career is derailed or he's going to lose out on how much money. We don't know, but that was me mostly. I know most of you in the chat room didn't really say much about it. But I was like, this guy is getting railroaded by the angels for putting him out there continuously and having this workload. Well, it turns out I was absolutely wrong. The angels were so criticized over their announcement for the UCL that they actually came out a couple days later and had to reveal to save face that Otani declined the team's early August offer for an MRI. So you got Balela, you got the agent over here keeping Otani quiet. All of the blame is going on to the angels when the angels GM finally came out and said, you know what? This guy refused to get an MRI when we told him to in August, not just August, early August, okay? Now, once that happened, Nez, the agent, held a press conference inside his Angel Stadium suite, his office suite, and he told the reporters to frame Otani's recovery in a favorable light. He basically tells these reporters how to say things and what to do. And of course, the agent is going to say that regardless of if it's true. But during that press conference... Otani injured his oblique right when this guy, Agent Nez, okay, was out there telling the media how to frame this stuff. Otani hurt his oblique, okay? He refused to talk to the press and he refused to go on the IL. So, when an MRI showed that he couldn't play the rest of the season, he went and cleaned out his locker before any media arrived, which led to crazy speculation. And, of course, we were all in on that, right? Like, oh, he cleaned out his locker, he's done, da, da, da. Well, that was, he was trying to avoid the media. He knew he wasn't going to play anymore that season. So he snuck in there, probably because his agent told him to, by the way. Here's a quote. After Otani's surgery, the Angels took the incredibly rare route of releasing a statement on behalf of his agency, the, his sports agent, Nez. It declined to state what surgery uh, Otani underwent, but included a quote from the surgeon, a Tommy John surgeon, by the way, about his timeline for recovery. None of it followed standard protocol. The Angels were desperate to stay in Otani's favor. They did not have the upper hand in this asymmetrical power dynamic. All of it was crafted by Otani's agent. Now, listen carefully. Otani saying that he prefers to play on the West Coast is a bunch of made-up bull dinky. Okay, he would never tell anybody that, especially after reading this article. So this idea that he doesn't want to play for the New York spotlight, bull dinky. Now, this idea that Otani wants to play with another Japanese player, no problem. I'll take that as common sense. When a guy doesn't even speak the language, of course, he would love to play on the same team as one of his former teammates and a guy who speaks the same language. I mean, to me, it's common sense. So, all right, I'll believe that. But it's really crazy. Now, the, uh, let me check up with the Malpal. Or no, not the Malpal, the chat room. <laughs> I saw Malpal's name there. All right. Tito Luna's here. Tito and Jeter Luna. It's wonderful to see both of you. <sighs> okay. It's moving on. All right. Great job. Thanks, Leonard. I have a few more things to talk about. Just let's talk about the Severino. I know Lenny already talked about the Severino signing, but I have something to say too. The New York Mets are still going to pay Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer a total of $41 million next year. But Steve Cohen is not broke, and we should feel no shame for saying that they might be willing to go all out again and try to win. I know Steve Cohen is trying to build a little uh, entertainment venue, including a casino right next to the ballpark. 
That will be fun and I will go and partake as possible. Now, Jason Stark talks about the New York uh, Mets getting Severino. He played eight seasons with the Yankees. Since 2018, injuries have robbed him of time. And he had Tommy John surgery in 2020, missed a couple months last in 2022 because of a lat strain. And last season, an oblique injury ended his year in September. Laura and Mary, I want to know how you feel about this signing of Severino. Now, it means nothing, okay, in respect to what the Mets plan to do, whether or not, the, obviously, Severino is a chance, a risk, but there's high reward to be had here if possible. He's 54 and 37 over his career with a 3.79 ERA and a 1.18 whip through 727 career innings pitched. The worst thing here. Now, this is a this is a an athletic reporter who his name is Will Salmon. He's the Mets staff writer for The Athletic. And Jason Stark uh, quoted him in his article about Severino and what he means to the Mets. He says, in a worst-case scenario, Kodai Senga and Jose Quintana, their lone returning starters who have locked down spots in the rotation, they could both regress either due to the league making adjustment in the case of Kodai Senga or age in the case of Quintana. Severino offers great upside. He's a risk in terms of the number of innings that he could provide. So New York still must consider that when building the rest of their staff, it needs a lot of work. I love to read the comments, okay? I love to go, when I read the articles at The Athletic, I really like to read the comments because half the time the comments to the articles are as informative as anything, right? Now, I'm not quoting the comments yet, but I will. This is also from Will Salmon, the Mets beat writer for The Athletic. He says the Mets entered the offseason needing to fill as many as three spots in their rotation. So it made sense for them to be involved in all of the market's tiers for pitching help. From here, the Mets will remain active. Severino gives them another piece as part of a foundation, but New York should still be in the market for a top starter plus another starter, <coughs> Otani and Yamamoto. <laughs> that's my little, okay, that's my little, all right. So they're still in the market for a top starter plus another starter who can log innings and provide stability. Now, you can't rely on Yamamoto for those things. And you definitely can't rely on Otani for those things. So if the Mets decided to get Otani and Yamamoto, they're not addressing the workhorse problem that they need at the top of their rotation. Jason Stark in the comments, the first comment says, there will be a lot of people overreacting about the Severino thing. He says, remember, there are more moves coming and Severino serves as a high upside back of the rotation option that is being paid like one. Also, he says the Mets are working towards a six-man rotation and could be betting that the extra rest will keep Severino healthy. Tim did a nice job breaking this down last week. He says 2024 is a compete year ahead 2024 is a compete year ahead a bigger 2025 contention. This gives them a year to evaluate the pitcher and determine if they want him as part of their future. To take this even further, Jason Stark says he cares more about who they sign to a longer term deal than who is pitching in 2024. Severino is 29 years old. We talked about the Blue Jays being in on the Soto talk now. The Blue Jays are one of several teams talking to the Padres about Soto, who is still only 25 years old. They say Otani, not Otani, 
that Soto would be an ideal fit for the Jays if they fail to land Otani. And if the Padres wait, other teams that miss out on Otani could enter the fray. The Padres are seeking a big multiplayer return for Soto, including Major League Ready or near Major League Ready pitching. I'm still checking the chat room. But nobody's talking about what I'm talking about. That's okay. We're all here to talk with each other. It's also possible that the Padres will accept lower level prospects if they believe those pitchers are sufficiently talented. Nick Martinez already left for the Reds. And what are the Reds doing, by the way? What are they doing? They have a home run ballpark and they sign Nick Martinez, which is fine. He's good. But then they sign Pagan, who is a huge fly ball guy. His ground ball rate, if I remember correctly, Malpal pointed out, was like 32% or something. It's not good for the Reds. They obviously still need a starting pitcher big time. But let's go back to Soto. The Padres are reportedly uh, targeting Clark Schmidt. We talked about who's not good anyway. Michael King, who is a sell-high candidate because he produced a 188 ERA in eight starts at the end of the season, they the Yankees currently view King as part of their 2024 rotation, but he is proven as a quality multi-inning reliever. From the Blue Jays, the Padres could seek a package including one or more pitchers like Ricky Tiedemann, Bowden Francis, and Alec Manoa. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that pleases Mal Pal. Can you imagine Manoa to the Padres? Oh, that would just make him so pissed off, okay? Because he stinks. Manoa is not good. Now, the Padres have discussed and proposed attaching Trent Grisham to Soto, which would allow the Yankees to address their needs in both center and left field, but remind you that if they get Soto... They do that for left field, and they are. Then they also got Oscar Gonzalez, so they do a need help in center field. Grisham is projected to earn nearly five million in arbitration, and he stunk last year, batting one ninety eight with a six 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 OPS. Another possibility, if they're unable to strike a satisfactory deal with a single trading partner, and I was so proud of Mal Powell. He brings this up to me. Before anybody, even the athletic, put this out, because Malpal, as I mentioned, is our resident Padres insider. He said they could involve a third club. The Mariners are known to make trades with the Padres. They they have desirable pitching, but might not want to part with it for only one year of Soto. So, just an example, the Mariners could acquire a longer-term offensive pieces from the team that lands Soto while sending pitching to San Diego. Malpal brought up when he told me an example of a third team could be the White Sox, where he would like to get Luis Robert, right? The Yankees could trade a couple of uh, prospects over to the White Sox who need the prospects. The Padres need regular MLB ready players. They could just take Luis Robert right off the White Sox hands, get rid of Juan Soto to the Yankees, and then the White Sox get a bunch of prospects. So that is just an example of one of these uh, teams that Im- these trades that involve three teams. I'm pretty sure Soto is going, right? I mean, they they aren't going to sign him. We 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 know how many already contracts that the Padres are committed to. I doubt they're going to sign him. And once you get po- past that, I mean, it's only a matter of time before Soto gets traded or they're not going to get anything for this guy. So I'd say the chances of Soto getting traded are extremely high. All right. Now that I'm going to end on because I was going to talk a little bit about the Reds, who are getting Matt McClain back. I think he's going to go underrated in drafts this year because he finished out the season with an oblique strain. He didn't play at all after August 27th. 
So these, you know, this recent memory bias is a real thing. And yes, Matt McClain was highly touted. And yes, he played good. But he ended the season on the on the injured list. And they say that's behind him. They say the Cincinnati Acquirer, specifically Inquirer, say that he's working out and he's already swinging without issue. He's 24 years old. He's preparing for a defensive role at either middle infield position, second base, or shortstop. You got a lot of other guys vying for that spot. Actually, I shouldn't say they're vying for that spot, but they're capable of playing these two spots. Jonathan India, we'll have to see what happens here, but you also have guys like Ellie De La Cruz, Noel V. Marte, Christian Encarnacion Strand, and Spencer Steele are all options for the left side of the infield. Now, you know, Encarnacion Strand is a first baseman. I would probably keep him out of the discussion, but since he was included in the discussion, I can't leave him out. I personally think he's going to stick at first base, no doubt about it. But you have other guys that can play, and their infield on the left side is quite crowded. That's all I got, everybody. So tomorrow, what are we talking about? Fantastic. What are we talking about tomorrow? I don't know. I'm still recovering from this. Leonard thinks I'm fantastic. Whatever happens today, we'll talk about Okay. Whatever happens today, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Boston Paul wants Alec Manoa to the Red Sox, and but he has no idea not, why. My balls are not shrinking, by the way. And Leonard is not on performance-enhancing drugs, and he wants you all to know that his balls are not shrinking. Okay? Sorry, Jeter Luna. <laughs> <laughs> Jeter Luna is probably old enough to hear this stuff by now. I don't know. The years just keep going by, and these kids, they grow up so fast. So... Eddie, everybody, we love you. We appreciate you more than you know, and we will catch you tomorrow. Lady and the Legend, 9 a.m. sharp. Have a wonderful Saturday afternoon.